All right, talking about bacteria and a little bit about viruses today. And then um, if, we have time, if we have time, we'll segue into talking about how we use bacterial enzymes and start manipulating bacteria, bacterial enzymes, bacterial plasmids, bacterial chromosomes for biotechnology. So we're kind of at a transition point right now. Um, this is going to be the last kind of traditional just genetics kind of thing. And the next steps are going to be how do we manipulate DNA? How do we manipulate RNA um, to do things that we want to do synthetically in cells? So I threw up a picture of bacteria here. This is the head of a pin under an electron, micro, uh, electron microscope. Uh, if you zoom in, you see all these tiny little bumps. All those tiny little bumps are actually little bacteria on that. And then here's a zoomed in picture of the actual bacteria. Uh, it's been estimated that there are more bacteria in your gut right now. If you counted up all the bacterial cells in your gut right now, it outnumbers the number of cells you actually have in your own body. Oh, so if you just took you and counted all the cells, there's more bacterial cells than there are human cells in you right now, uh, which is a pretty dramatic thing to think about. Um, now, the bacterial cells are very small, right? And you've got a lot of cells that actually are fairly large. Um, if you think about I don't know, like salivary gland cells are pretty big. If you think about some neurons in your spine, there's actually neurons that are going from the base of your spine, and the single cell is going all the way down to the tip of your toe. So you've got some pretty dramatically large cells, comparatively speaking. But there's a lot of, a lot of significance, actually, to what's going on in bacteria. So we left off last time talking about um, bacterial plasmids and these F factor plasmids. The the F factor plasmids are the ones that contain the genes necessary for making this pilus, this little tube that connects two bacteria, and then they transfer the genetic material. And we we're talking about these strains that are called HFR strains, the high frequency of recombination. That is, there's a high frequency of the F factor plasmid recombining, having crossing over events with the actual bacteria's genome. Okay? So here is a bacteria, then blue is its genome, and here is its F factor plasmid. So it has undergone conjugation. That's where the two bacteria, that's an F plus bacteria, makes a pilus, connects with an F minus bacteria that doesn't have the plasmid, and conjugation is the exchange of the chromosome. So uh, high, uh, uh, conjugation happened. This guy got its uh, F factor plasmid. And an HFR strain says there's a high frequency that that plasmid that it's gotten will recombine with the genome. And so here I have an integrated F factor. Right? The F factor in pink here is actually recombined at one spot. And just like recombination between two homologous chromosomes, uh, what's happened is this has crossed over and has now incorporated itself into the genome. So this bacteria thinks it's F plus. I mean, it is F plus. It has that genetic material. But when it goes and actually starts to undergo conjugation with another bacteria, when it replicates its F factor, it replicates the F factor, but then will also start replicating some of the actual bacterial genome. And it creates a pilus, hooks up with an, a, an F minus strain, one that doesn't have the F factor. And in conjugation now, it's actually including the F factor sequence but with it is coming genome sequence. And so in these rare cases, I now have a bacteria that for some genes will act as if it's diploid. Right? Normally, a bacteria has got one copy of the genome, and it's got one copy of every gene. There's no uh, dominant and recessive things going on here because there's not a dominant and recessive allele. Right? It's just expressing whatever trait it has. It's got one allele for every gene. Well, now I could actually have two alleles for the region that actually comes in. And it's probably not the entire genome. It's just a portion of the genome that was close to where that F factor integrated. OK, so it's making a copy of its F factor. And then some portion of the genome next to it would come alongside. So it's only going to act diploid for, for things that were adjacent to it. Now you can actually have two alleles. You could then have additional recombination between the new genome and the existing genome in this newly conjugated uh, bacteria. 
So I could have recombination events happening here, and now I can actually start having what comes close to maybe Mendelian type genetics, right? Crossing over events, and then the daughter cells might have one of the two alleles, depending on which, which got integrated into the genome, okay? Now, that is a, an integrated F factor. The F factors can also, if they've undergone recombination to get in, they can undergo recombination at the same spot and loop themselves back out. So here is a F factor, it's in green this time, but an F factor is incorporated into the bacterial chromosome. And obviously this is not to scale, right? The bacterial chromosome is, is really huge comparatively, but so you can see the whole circle, we just make it shorter. Um, here, this F factor recombined right where the green and the blue meet, right? It was originally circular and the genome was circular. It came together, there was recombination, and the two turned into a single, um, single circular chromosome. Well, what could happen is those, that site where the blues and the greens meet could come back together and you could loop it straight back out again. Under, you know, under ideal circumstances, it would just remove itself and nothing else leaving the genome intact behind it, right? Now, what sometimes happens when it loops out is it loops out and doesn't just loop out the green portion of the original F factor. It loops out and brings some of the bacterial genome along with it. So we now have a plasmid that contains all the information that's in green here that used to be on the plasmid itself, but now the plasmid has additional sequence from the genome. And it may have gotten a, a gene. So in, uh, in orange here is LAC plus. This is the gene that allows this bacteria to metabolize lactose instead of glucose if necessary. So now I have a plasmid that is carrying an actual functional gene for some metabolic process, some like essential process that the bacteria does. So it's still a plasmid, right? It's not a part of the genome, but now it has genome genes on it. So now if this bacterial plasmid starts getting exchanged between bacteria, we could actually exchange genetic information and not have to do any recomb recombination anymore at all, right? If, uh, if a bacteria that has this plasmid infects another bacteria, I can get exchange of genetic information, but I don't even have to have recombination events anymore as long as that first recombination event got that gene onto the plasmid. Does this make sense? So there's a lot of plasmids kind of floating around in bacterial communities, and some of them are uh, having, you know, in this case, a functional LAC-Z gene, or uh, yeah, LAC-Z gene, allowing it to metabolize lactose. Some of them have ampicillin resistance genes or other metabolic genes, and so, you know, bacteria are, are exchanging information a little bit. Now, we can use this integration of these F-factor plasmids and these high-frequency um, recombination strains to actually map where genes are located on the bacterial chromosome. So here is an HFR strain. This is, um, this is just a simple representation of the bacterial's genome, and the F-factor has incorporated into, has recombined, and now is inside the genome, okay? Now, when this high frequency, this HFR strain, infects a F minus strain, you can set up basically what's the bacterial equivalent of a test cross, okay? So what I have here in this F minus strain, and this has just been engineered by, by selective breeding of the bacteria, um, this F minus strain doesn't have an F factor, so it, it will be the recipient of conjugation if it's in the presence of an HFR strain or an F plus strain. And what the researchers have done here is they've got defective genes on its genome. It's mutated in its, all these essential metabolic genes so that this F minus strain is lac minus. That means it's unable to metabolize lactose. It's gal minus, unable to metabolize galactose. It's threonine and leucine minus. It can't make threonine and it can't make leucine. So this bacteria here is, the, is like your tester, right? It's like your homozygous recessive. He's like deficient for all of these metabolic processes. So to grow that bacteria, you would have to put in the medium 
like in the, uh, the fluid, the liquid that is growing in, or the LB plate that you make, you'd have to put in all of these essential nutrients, right? Because he's unable to do anything with them on his own, right? So the HFR strain in this experiment has got good copies, positive, wild-type, functional copies of all these genes. And when you l put these two together, they're going to conjugate, because this guy's got the F-factor plasmid integrated into his genome. And if you let them sit, they're going to ex start exchanging the information, right? The, uh, the F-factor portion of the, the genome is going to replicate itself. And then as it replicates, some of the adjacent genes are going to start getting replicated as well and getting passed on to this, this deficient bacteria. Uh, what these guys did in this experiment is they just put the two strains together in a, in a dish in solution, uh, allowed for conjugation to happen, but only for eight minutes. So here's minutes after you put the two strains together. After eight minutes, what they did was agitate it really hard. They just started vigorously shaking the whole situation. And basically, it's going to break the pillus. Okay? So you, you put them together. They're all nice and happy. They're warm. They're undergoing conjugation. And then you just roughly shake the whole thing, and it breaks all of these conjugation events apart. Then you start growing things on, on plates now. What happens is, this guy who used to not be able to grow on a plate unless it had threonine and leucine on it, right? He was deficient for making threonine and leucine, so you had to provide those in the media. What happened is this guy is now capable of growing on a plate that's missing those. So what we know is wherever the integration of the F factor was, very close to it were the wild type copies from this HFR strain, okay? Because we knew he was deficient. He threonine and leucine. Uh, enzymes were deficient. But if I let it go for eight minutes, then, then the, uh, the F factor itself is replicated and brought along with it wild type copies, functional copies of those genes. So you can start creating a genetic map in the bacteria, right? If I start doing a little uh, map here, I'd say, well, this blue region is the, the F factor plasmid region. And right next to it in the genome must have been the threonine and leucine gene. Then you do the experiment again. You recombine that same deficient for all traits, the HFR strain that's positive for all traits, and this time you let it go for nine minutes. And then you shake and disrupt the conjugation. And then you plate out these bacteria and you see what can they grow on now. Now they are able to grow on threonine and leucine and they're able to tolerate a bacteria or a, a, an antibiotic. This is the AZI. So now I know that the leucine and threonine and the AZI are, and now we can't say map units, right? Because we're not looking for recombination. Uh, you have to, to present these units in terms of minutes of conjugation, right? So one minute of conjugation away is the next gene that comes along, right? And you just keep repeating this, letting the conjugation go for longer and longer. And every new trait that is acquired, you can kind of put a relative position about how far away it must have been on the genome. So you let it go for 10 minutes, and now uh, a resistance to, um, to another, or another uh, antibiotic. You let it go for 10 minutes, and I get nothing new. But if I let it go 16 minutes, then I get the ability to metabolize lactose. So I'm just creating a map for how far things must have been away from the F factor in the genome. Yeah. What happens is that they'll purposely put in a, a, a bacteria with a genome that's deficient for a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. And then when it conjugates with a bacteria that is deficient, the one we want to know about, that's how we determine it's, uh, like, it's how it determines what's on it or what's it's Yeah, well, we're, we're basically mapping what is on this chromosome that's getting, that's getting replicated and put in the new cell. And right. you do that by breaking the pill eye each time. Break the pill eye each time. Yeah, let it go for eight minutes, break it, see what, what new traits came along. Let it go for nine minutes, break the pill eye, see what came along. So you're testing for these resistance guys, right? Because these guys are not going to be able to grow if, unless you provide them all the nutrients they need. Which means if they're growing, that means it has to be from It must have acquired it from this guy. Got it. And how long it took in the conjugation tells you relatively how far away it was it from the F factor that was replicating itself. 
So this is bacterial type genetics. Um, so that, that wraps up the first way that, gene, uh, that bacteria can exchange genetic information. That's conjugation, right? Two bacteria actually intentionally making this pili and, and interchanging their, uh, their genetic material. The second way bacteria exchange information is through a process called transformation. Uh, transformation is also unidirectional, right? It's just it's going to be one bacteria receiving genetic information. It's not going to be an exchange. But instead of um, DNA coming from an HFR or an F plus strain and actually intentionally being put into a different bacteria, this is from extracellular DNA. DNA that just may be floating around in the environment that this bacteria is in. Uh, the, the reason bacteria would do this um, is kind of somewhat unknown. People kind of postulate that maybe this is like a last ditch effort if a bacteria is in really stressful environments. Uh, you know, if you heat up bacteria too hot, they're going to start dying. Uh, if you heat them up, though, to just to the point where they're just about to die, <laughs> they're really stressed out, uh, they will start just like bringing in all kinds of things from the environment, kind of as a last uh, effort to maybe, maybe there's something in the environment that would help them survive this stressful situation. And I guess the idea is maybe other bacteria have died and released their DNA, and so that bacteria might like pull up any of that DNA that's around that might code for a gene that's going to help them out here. Um, it's kind of a weird, uh, I don't know, tentative, tentative explanation. I'm not sure if it's actually really true, but that's the idea. Um, so a competent cell is a cell that is capable of bringing this stuff in. If you just put a normal bacteria in just a normal, healthy, happy environment for the bacteria, he's not going to be pulling in foreign DNA. I mean, that's, that's probably a bad idea under normal circumstances to just bring in foreign DNA. You might bring in viral DNA or something toxic, right? Uh, but if you're under really stressful circumstances, maybe if you're going to die anyway, you know, maybe bring in something that might help. So you can make cells competent by basically stressing them. Uh, you can stress them and then freeze them. And then whenever you thaw those bacteria out, they're going to start bringing in whatever stuff you put around it. So this is a way for us to manipulate what gets into a bacterial cell. To make a competent cell, you can either chemically treat them. So there's chemicals that basically stress their membrane, and, and so they start kind of uh, preparing to bring in uh, foreign stuff. Or you can actually electrically do this as well. You can shock them with electricity volts. That stresses them out, and they'll start bringing in, back, bringing in what's ever in the environment. Um, you could also do this by a heat shock. So if you just brought those bacteria up to a critical heat temperature where they're still living but about to kind of die off, uh, that will also make them competent to bring in foreign DNA. Then what they're going to do is bring in whatever DNA, and in our cases, whatever DNA we stick in the solution that they're in. Uh, so this is almost always a, a mechanism by which we artificially introduce DNA into them. Okay. So here is a recipient bacteria. We've stressed it or somehow made it competent. And then you surround it with whatever piece of DNA you want to get in there. In this case, it's a double-stranded uh, linear piece of DNA. You heat shock it, and it transports that in. And if you've designed that to be a uh, sequence that's homologous to its genome, what could happen is uh, you stress it, it brings in all of the, the foreign DNA, and then you quickly put it into a happy place. Right? Lots of nutrients, nice temperature, you know, get it to not be stressed anymore so that it survives. And then it will, if there's complementary sequence, it might actually recombine with a foreign piece of DNA that you've put in there. So in this case, here is a, so this is hard to see, but this is an A minus strain. It's just some theoretical gene. It's got a mutant non-functional copy of it. If you introduce a good copy, an A plus copy, on some homologous sequence, then what could happen is it could bring in your foreign DNA, and then you could have recombination events on either side, and you could get the good copy integrated into the bacteria's genome. And now, subsequently, he's got a positive good copy of that gene now. So this is transformation. This is kind of artificially forcing them to take things up for you. 
the questions about transformation. I'm not going to go too much into this. You can do this with either linear DNA or circular plasmid DNA. It's pretty small pieces, though. You can't get a bacteria to take up an entire other bacteria's genome. Uh, it's going to be just a very small piece that's, that's going to be able to get inside. Yeah. How does it know what to take up? It doesn't. This is a pretty non-specific process. So the only reason it's taking up this is because in the laboratory, you put the bacteria in there with that thing. Um, if you put it in there with viral DNA, it would take the viral DNA in, and that would be a bad thing for the bacteria to have done. Right? So like I said, I don't really know what happens, what, what this looks like, actually bacteria living in their natural habitats. Um, but in the laboratory, you can force this to happen. And then you just specifically put whatever you want it to bring in. But it's just doing that kind of at, at random. Right. So next week, we are going to transform bacteria. We've got, well, we took our PCR product this week. Hopefully, we've ligated together and made a bacterial plasmid. And then we're going to try and get bacteria to bring that plasmid into their cells, and we're going to to uh, heat shock competent cells and see if we can get them to go in. All right, conjugation, transformation. The last way that DNA gets exchanged between bacteria is through bacteriophage, through viruses that infect bacteria. So here's that original um, image that I showed you at the beginning. Here's the bacteria. If you were to zoom in even further on the surface of that bacteria, uh, you could find, if there were present, little viruses that were actually infecting the bacteria. And we called these guys phage. So it's a little, uh, this is all, this is non-cellular, right? Viruses don't have cell membranes. So all of this coat is actually proteins. So this is a protein coat in this head, and that's where it's holding its, uh, its genetic information. It's got this little shaft, and then it's got these little proteins that have special adhering properties, and they actually stick to bacteria. So they will actually recognize bacteria su cell surface proteins. They'll grab those cell surface proteins and stick themselves on. And then they will actually penetrate, poke a hole in the cell membrane, and inject their, their genetic information into the bacteria. This process of, of manipulating this normal thing that happens, right? There's bacteria in the environment, and there's bacteria phages in the environment infecting them. Uh, if we use this and manipulate it to get our own DNA in, we call it transduction. Okay, so we've got conjugation, transformation, and transduction now. All right. So this is transferring genetic material from one bacteria, a donor bacteria, to another. Right, we're trying to just manipulate this and get one bacteria's genes into a different bacteria. Uh, but if we can trick viruses to take up the bacterial's DNA, and then we can use that virus to infect our other strain of bacteria. Okay. So one bacteria is going to be the donor. What we're going to do is have a donor bacteria. We're going to trick a phage into bringing that, packaging that uh, donor DNA into its head group instead of its own genome. And so we're going to basically use the, uh, the virus as like an empty shuttle. We're just going to like use it as a packaging material to get one bacteria's DNA. The virus doesn't know what it's contained in its head, right? So if we tricked it to hold some other bacteria in there, uh, it'll go find a sep another bacteria, and it'll inject whatever DNA it's got in its head. And so we can actually use this to transfer DNA from one bacteria to another. So uh, this requires the virus to, to somewhat recognize it. And so we're going to use phage vectors, right? These are viruses and viral DNA that we repackage with bacterial, or you could do it with human DNA. I'm, DNA is DNA is DNA, right? Uh, you, can, you could fool a virus into packaging human DNA and then get the virus to infect a bacteria and insert human DNA into a virus or into a bacteria. Uh, so you can manipulate this any way you want. We call these things phage vectors. A vector is just any mechanism that you use to transfer DNA from one source to another. Okay? So these are phage vectors. Now, this is what you could potentially have happen. These are two, um, two lifestyles of viruses. Uh, here is a little phage, this little guy. 
and he has just infected this bacteria, this host bacteria, and he is injected. And for this, we're just going to talk about just a normal phage, just this normal, what a phage would normally do, okay? So it injects its own DNA. And it can do two things, depending on what kind of phage it is. First of all, it could just go what's called through the lytic cycle. The lytic cycle is just a phage replicating itself in a bacteria and just repackaging itself, okay? Uh, examples of these are T2 or T4 phage. These are just common bacteria phages, and they only go through this cycle. So they inject their DNA into the bacteria, uh, and then they hijack the cell's machinery. Basically, they turn off uh, the, the bacteria's ability to replicate its own genome, and instead they co-opt the cell to start making copies of the viral genome, okay? So you can just have a single phage insert a single phage genome into a bacteria, and then the bacteria will start replicating the phage's DNA for itself, okay? Now, those will build up, and then genes on the phage's genome, the viral genes, will start getting expressed. These are the proteins necessary for packaging and making us a new phage head, an actual protein coat. So genes will start getting expressed off of the virus. The cell packages all of those viral genomes into new phage proteins. And after a while, those will build up so much that the cell actually just dies. Uh, you've completely hijacked all the cell's metabolism. You've just the virus hijacks it, just everything is focused now on making copies of the phage genome and assembling all the phage proteins. And at that point, the cell will die and it'll release all of these new phage particles and now I've got all these new infectious particles to go infect more bacteria. Yeah? Um, is it something that the, uh, the, the bacteriophage does to force the bacteria to start replicating that one? That one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we could get into viral genetics, and it's really interesting the way it shuts down bacteria. It really does. It, like, shuts down the bacteria's functioning. And so a couple of genes that get expressed immediately off of that infecting um, genome will go and turn off the cell's metabolism. And it hijacks a lot of the cell machinery. Like, the, the virus itself is not competent to... Uh, it doesn't have enough genes to actually replicate and package and do all the gene expression of its own genome. It actually has to have a host bacteria's proteins and enzymes in order to copy itself, in order to express all of its own genes, and in order to package itself. So it can't do that without a bacterial host. And so it's really interesting ways that the viral genes turn on, turn off the bacterial genes, and hijack them to start recognizing its own promoters and stuff like that. Um, you know, we could teach a whole course on that. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting stuff. So it's, it's not just like, not just like, you know, replicating itself in the background and just hijacking, or, or, or just like, uh, you know, not hijacking, hitchhiking. It's not hitchhiking, right? It's actually hijacking. It's taking over all the processes, focusing them all onto making its own genome and making its own proteins. So, uh, so that is a, uh, a lytic cycle. A phage that only can undergo a lytic cycle is called a virulent phage. A virulent phage will just infect a bacteria and eventually just kill the cell and release more bacteria. Okay. It's kind of a, a one, one time only kind of thing. Uh, certain other phages can either go through the virulent phage, the lytic phage, or they can go through what's called the lysogenic phase. Now what happens here is the first phage DNA gets incorporated into the infected host but instead of immediately hijacking the cell's processes and making more, what it does is just inserts its genome into the host. Now this is a tricky mechanism here because this means that every time the bacteria cell replicates its genome and creates a daughter cell, that daughter cell now contains the viral genome there as well. So even though it's not actively making new copies of itself and packing to them and infecting, this can be spreading through a population because every time this bacteria now divides, it's copying the viral genome as well. So viruses will typically insert themselves and stay dormant for a while. They just hang out there, wait for the cell itself to 
to replicate. Now I've got hundreds, hundreds of thousands of copies of a bacteria, and all of them now are infected with the virus. Then some stimulus happens. Um, typically, it's a stress event. If the, uh, if the bacteria is stressed, the bacteria is almost going to die. The virus will kind of recognize that and say, ah, this is no longer a happy host to just be hanging out in. And it will induce the lytic cycle. Okay? So some event happens that triggers the virus to think that this is a, uh, no longer a happy virus to be in anymore. It will loop itself out, enter the lytic cycle, and hijack the cell, make lots of copies of itself, package all those copies in its proteins, and exit the cell, you know, killing the cell off. But it's basically triggered by an event that says, we need to make copies of ourselves and go infect someplace else because this cell isn't healthy anymore. So you could actually manipulate all of this process if you want. right? You could actually trick a phage into containing whatever DNA you want. The phage will then incorporate your DNA that you wanted into the bacteria. And then you can grow that bacteria for you know, multiple generations, keep lots of copies of your DNA around. Then whenever you want it back, you could induce that bacteria to enter the lytic cycle. You could get copies of your gene packaged into the virus, and then you can go infect more virus or more bacteria again. Uh, so both of these processes we can, we can manipulate. Um, a phage that can do both of them, the lysogenic and the lytic phase, are called temperate. Basically, like whatever conditions are appropriate, it will go into one of the two phases. If conditions are good for the bacteria, it'll stay in the lysogenic phase. If you stress the bacteria, it recognizes there's a different temperament to the bacteria. It goes into the lytic cycle and, and creates more phage. An example of this is lambda phage. This is a really common one that's used in a lot of genetic labs. So, yeah? Um, so lambda phage is the same thing as a temperate phage, but temperate phage is describing a cycle, and lambda phage is just an example? Uh, yeah, so okay. a lambda phage is an actual virus type. Okay. It is an example of a temperate phage. Oh. So there's all kinds of temperate phages. Lambda is just one of those that's just commonly used. Okay. So this is a type, and this is a token, if, if you're a philosopher. The type is temperate. One of the examples of that is a lambda phage. Since phage infect bacteria, uh, this is, we have to culture them with bacteria. Uh, this plate was actually covered with a lawn of bacteria. The entire surface of that plate was just coated with bacteria. And then we infected with some virus. And the virus starts infecting the bacterial cells. And if it's undergoing the lytic phase, where it's actually bursting open the cells, what you get is these clear spots. And that is a, a place where a single uh, a single virus infected a single bacteria, and as it's then been reinfecting more and more bacteria, those bacteria are dying off, and so we see these little plaques, plaques forming, these little clearings, indicating that all the bacteria in that region have died, and it's because the virus is infecting them. Right. So these little guys are called plaques or little clearings. The entire thing was called a lawn of bacteria. And as long as the two plaques don't touch each other, we could still go in and we could pick out you know, that region, scoop up some viruses, and go you know, make more viral plaques, put them on more plates. So each one of these is a separate colony, basically a virus that is infecting just those localized bacteria around them. Now, as soon as they start growing together, you're going to have mixing, and you might not have a, a single viral strain. But if you want to get just a single strain of viruses, you dilute the virus down, really, really dilute. You infect a lawn of bacteria, and so we know that, that that little plaque is a single strain of viruses. We can go collect them. So. All right, this is transduction. There's two forms of transduction, the way we manipulate transduction. The first is called generalized transduction. So in generalized transduction, uh, it's through the lytic cycle. So we have a phage. It's infecting a donor bacteria. This is the way we're going to manipulate the process of transduction to move the genes that we want around. Okay? 
So you get a phage. It infects the donor. Here's the donor's genome. We've simplified it, and it's just got three genes on it, A, B, and C. Okay. To do generalized transduction, what you do is you force the bacteria to fragment their genome. Okay, so you infect with a phage, you fragment the genome, and then when the virus starts packaging up the pieces of DNA into its head, so we're just going through the lytic phase, right? It's, the virus is making lots and lots of copies of itself. It's, it's expressing its proteins, it's packaging the proteins together in these little phage heads. And when it packages them together, if the genome has been fragmented, then some of the pieces of the genome will actually get packaged into the phage heads. The phage, instead of packaging its own genome, will sometimes package by accident, basically, pieces of the bacterial genome. Okay? So it packages itself up. It actually lyses the cell. And now I've got little phage units. Some of them just are transmitting their own phage genome. But some of them contain the bacteria genes. So if I were to infect, take one of the viruses, if one of those viruses infects another bacteria, Instead of passing on its own genome, it's passing on the A plus gene, right? the wild type functional copy of the A gene. If the bacteria that accepted it was A minus and you had a recombination event, we have said that you've done generalized transduction. We have actually moved the A plus gene, got it to recombine in an A minus strain, and now this, this new bacteria has got a good functional copy of the A plus gene. This is generalized transduction because it's random, right? I ran, the, the genome was randomly fragmented, and whatever genes come along is just a random process. So this is called generalized transduction. You can actually do mapping of bacteria this way, too. Uh, you can look for linkage based on which pieces of DNA come together, right? Uh, if A and B are really close together on the bacterial genome, then under generalized transduction, they will often go together. And you'll see the recipient bacteria uh, getting a functional copy of A and a functional copy of B, because they're really close together. Uh, so you can do some mapping. Then you can say, well, how often does B go with C? And you can get some kind of transduction rate. And that'll give you an estimate of how far away they, where they were from each other on the genome. Right? So you could actually do a mapping project and say, how far is A from B, how far is B from C, and how far is C from A, based on how often do they go together in this, this transduction method. That's a generalized transduction. It's just random. We're just based on how did the genome get fragmented to begin with. Uh, the second method is called specialized transduction. This is where we're going to be specifically manipulating the virus DNA so that it specifically puts the genes we want into the donor, or I, I'm sorry, into the recipient. So you're going to basically customize, make a custom piece of phage DNA so that when it infects a bacteria, it will specifically put the gene that you want in there, okay? So it's not a randomized fashion. So here is uh, the circularized uh, phage genome here. So I have to first custom make myself a, a phage. And we're going to do this by infecting, um, a, uh, we're going to manipulate a phage to bring in this circularized phage genome. All right. So we've manipulated this in such a way that it has a really high region of homology. Okay. What I'm trying to do is basically get a gene from a bacteria, a specific gene from a bacteria, into a phage genome so that when I infect a different bacteria, I, that specific gene will move, right? So instead of just generally fragmenting the genome and, and, and depending upon this random process of it getting packaged and then getting into it, I'm going to try and specifically get one in. So I try and make my phage genome recombine at a specific location next to the gene I want to move. Okay? This is why it's specialized transduction. I'm going to specifically try and move, in this case, uh, this gal gene. Okay? So you make your phage genome have homologous sequence to a region next to the gene you want. When you infect, and if this is going to require it to be a lysogenic uh, or a temperate phage, 
right? the phage like a lambda that actually wants to incorporate into the genome. So depending on what you're doing, you've you got to pick the appropriate virus. So uh, this would be like a lambda phage, okay? So lambda phage will often recombine into the bacterial chromosome, and if I have made it a nice homologous region, it will more often than not go and recombine there, okay? So it goes in, I've incorporated my viral genome in there, and then I sometimes, you know, we're going to try and specifically move this gene, but you still have to wait for the uncommon event, right? Most of the time, if I now, so I'll, I'll grow a, 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 a population of bacteria that has this uh, lambda phage genome incorporated into it, and then I will stress the cells and force them to go into the lytic stage. Normally what's going to happen is uh, that virus will recognize this, this is a bad, hostile environment. I should probably pull myself out of this bacteria's genome, undergo the lytic phase, and make more copies of my virus. Under normal circumstances, if everything goes correctly, it will recombine at the spot where it originally went in, it will loop itself out, and it'll undergo the, lysa, uh, the, the lytic phase and, and lyse the cell, make more copies. On rare occasions, though, it might actually recombine inappropriately, right? Instead of recombining at the spots where it first went in, now it's recombining a little bit further up over here, right? So it recombines, and when it recombines, it's brought along that GAL plus gene. This is the gene for uh, metabolizing galactose. So here, my virus genome is in blue, and it's incorporated some of the bacterial genome. Now I've done specialized transduction, because now every phage that, uh, that infects now is actually containing that copy of the gene that I want, and so I can use this phage, you know, it's going to undergo the, the lytic cycle, it's going to make lots of copies of this now, it's going to package all those copies of that into phage heads, and now I can go infect other bacteria, and those bacteria will now acquire the GAL plus gene. Right. So this is specialized. I'm actually moving a specific gene rather than just random fragments. Yeah? So is the whole thing specialized, or is it just the rare abnormal that get that takes out the Yeah, technology? yeah. So you have to do this. You know, you stress lots and lots of bacteria. And very, very infrequently, this will happen, and you'll actually get that gene going along. right? And now when I use that to move this piece of DNA, now I'm doing specialized transduction. So yeah, the process of creating this guy is, is a long, tedious process and a lot of screening to make sure I got the right thing to come along. But once I've gotten this to happen, now I've basically got a phage that I can keep growing in bacteria, and it's containing the gene that I wanted to, to move around. So this is the, um, the virus, the lambda phage now that has the GAL plus. I could, in fact, infect some other bacteria that was missing that gene. And if recombination happens between those, I can actually transfer the GAL plus. And now I have, I basically have changed the genome of some other bacterial strain. You know, this genome of this bacterial strain used to be deficient for galactose metabolism. Well, if I infect it with this virus with my good copy and recombination happens, I have stably transduced it now. I've actually incorporated this new gene permanently into the virus's genome, or into the bacteria's genome. Is so. injecting it a lot easier than getting it out, the gene that you want? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, injecting it, you don't really inject it. I mean, you just require, you know, uh, phage just packages itself and you infect, right? Yeah. yeah. I just meant, like, does it leave it? Like, you were talking about how it takes several times to extract the gene that you want yeah. through special transduction. But when you want to go and put it into another chromosome, is that a lot easier? Well, it's easier. It's easy to get the virus to stick it, this new viral genome in there. The recombination here is also going to be a random event. Uh -oh. So you have to do more and more times, trials to do this, screen out, and make sure you actually got it stably in there. This kind of technology has been worked out in phage right, in bacteriophage, where we're trying to just move around bacterial genes between each other. Um, what people are trying to do is now do gene therapy and try and get 
viruses to actually infect diseased patients and bring along a good wild type copy and actually change people's genome, right? The same process, in theory, could work in a human, right? If you had uh, a diseased individual, right? So instead of being a bacteria that can't metabolize galactose, maybe this is a person who can't make insulin, right? Uh, well, if we could get the good copy of the insulin gene, infect a virus, get a virus that infects human cells, we could actually um, try and package the good copy of the insulin gene into a human virus, get that human virus to infect cells of the pancreas, and then actually get a good uh, insulin gene back in and, and cure somebody's disease by doing, this would be called gene therapy if we were doing it in humans, right? Um, this has been tried a lot with pretty spotty results. Um, you can kind of get it to work in cell culture, but actually getting people diseases cured uh, is difficult. Um, sometimes there's an underlying cause of the disease. Even though you put a good copy of the insulin gene in, if those cells are deficient and they don't, you know, don't express it, then you haven't gotten anywhere. Uh, if there's an underlying cause, like for instance, um, I don't know, some other like neural degenerative disease, right? If there's some reason why cells are dying or cells are getting died, you know, you could put a good copy of a gene and like restore function in those cells. But if there's some underlying cause that then causes them to die again, you haven't quite cured it yet. But there's, you know, there was a lot of buzz and a lot of, uh, a lot of excitement around gene therapy in like the late, late 90s, and it kind of just didn't pan out very well. There's still anti-cancer therapies and, and some people still working on, uh, on gene therapy, but it's still, we haven't like cured anybody's diseases yet, though the prospect is really high. So yeah, Rachel. Yeah, it, well, exactly. So you have to really, anytime you're infecting somebody with a virus intentionally, you've got to be really careful, right? To make sure that, it, you know, that, that what you want to happen is what happens and not something worse, right? Uh, because if you infected somebody's cells and what you wanted to do was replace, the, you know, the deficient insulin gene with the, the good gene that would produce insulin for you, the enzyme that would make en insulin. But instead, what happens is this inserts in some other essential gene then you have just induced a new mutation in that cell, right? Or if you, this introduces someplace um, and, and disrupts a you know, tumor suppressor gene, then that cell now has become cancerous. Uh, or if this virus starts just moving around all over the place. All right, so working with viruses is very tricky to make sure that just the event you want to happen happens and not something else, yeah. So that's part of the problem with, with the gene therapy treatments is getting past you know, the side effects that are possible, right? Yeah. Yeah. Do they use targeting proteins for that? Or? Yeah, so they, I mean, they try and use homologous sequences, right? So this thing can only incorporate into the genome exactly where you want it and not any place else. Um, and yeah, then trying to, to, uh, to incorporate in here uh, proteins that, uh, that would increase the rate of recombination. And then they also are trying to manipulate the virus so that it will only infect the diseased cells. Because you don't want to go, you know, treating a disease, uh, you know, you want the cells to only infect the diseased pancreatic cells, not go up into your brain and start in, you know, inserting things into your brain cells, right? We want to specifically target just the disease. Um, there's also anti-cancer treatments that are trying to do this. If we took a virus that would just recognize cancerous cells in your body, then they could inject a gene that would kill the cancer cell and not, not affect any other. But obviously, that's got problems, too, because you only want to kill the cancer cells. You don't want to kill normal functioning cells. And you know, so people are looking into what are the proteins that are expressed on the surface of cancer cells and, and try and design uh, viruses that would only infect those cells. Uh, that's kind of a hard thing to do because yeah, lots, of, lots of cells express lots of different proteins. And finding something that is exclusively only expressed in cancer cells is difficult. So. All right. We're done. We'll start uh, restriction enzymes and recombinant DNA next time. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. 
Visit Biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.